Okay, so the uh, working title of this year, I might change it by the end, but the current working title, let me see what my last uh, decision was, is to call this year, Neither Hamas nor the Nazis are halakhically amalek according to the Rambam. <laughs> okay, um, and uh, I called it that because I want to be very, very clear about what the objective of this year is and is not. Uh, so I, I made a partial list of what the objectives of the year are not. Okay, so I'm going to just go through that just so we're all on the same page here. Um, so the objective of this year is not to learn through the two partios in the Torah about Amalek. Okay, uh, we will read them uh, just so we can get context, but but we're not going to be learning through the partios, nor is it to learn through any of the other references to Amalek in Tanakh or Chazal. It is also not to understand why the Torah commands us to eradicate Amalek. Okay, we will read some statements from the Rambam where he, he touches on that, but that's not at all. Um, we're not talking, uh, going to look into the Tam Mitzvah about why the Torah wants us to do this. We're certainly not going to talk about the uh, moral justification of the commandment to eradicate Amalek or the seven nations. Okay, that's a big topic in general about the Torah's position on, you know, what appears to be genocide. Um, we're also not going to clarify the halakhic parameters of Mechias Amalek, of wiping out Amalek then and now. So, for example, there are questions about whether this mitzvah of eradicating Amalek is a mitzvah on individuals or is it on the nation? Uh, do you need a king? Do you need a... Uh, uh, a melech, you know, what's the status of fulfilling this mitzvah nowadays? Um, we're not going to talk about that. And we're also not going to talk about any Rishon other than the Rambam. Okay. So the main goal of this year is um, you can really formulate it as one goal, but I decided to break it down for clarity. So I'm going to, and uh, I, I thought hard about this formulation here. The objective of this year is to demonstrate beyond a reasonable doubt that according to the Rambam, the mitzvah of Mechias Amalek, eradicating Amalek, applies exclusively to the biological descendants of the ethnic nation of Amalek and cannot halakhically apply to any other nation. Is that how you spell descendants or is it with an E? No, it's A. Okay, I always forget that. Yeah, okay, so um, so uh, that's the goal, okay? And uh, to elaborate on why I'm giving the here, secondary objective, therefore the oft-cited view ascribed to Rav Moshe Soloveitchik Zatzal by the Rav, by Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik, that's all his son. So the offside view that according to the Rambam, quote, any nation that conspires to destroy Knesset Yisrael becomes according to Halakha Amalek, that view is either wrong or it was intended as a drush. Okay? Um, yeah. Sorry uh, if you're having uh, connection difficulties, uh, Alex. Um, yeah. Mine is also fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, Okay, likewise, again, this is just doing this, for the sake of, doing this for the sake of clarity. I want to correct the widespread view that, quote, Amalek is an ideology. Um, uh, I, to correct the widespread view that Amalek is an ideology. Yeah, hold on, that's a poorly formulated. Okay, to correct the mistaken impression that, quote, Amalek is an ideology is a widespread view. OK, I think that there are a lot of people, especially uh, in my circles, who uh, who think that like Amalek is an ideology. In fact, so many people think that Amalek is an ideology that that I think that they think that that just is the halakha. They're not aware that it's a minority view. They're not aware that it's not shot in the Rambam. And uh, I think it's just like, a, you know, it's just a, a lack of, uh, of perspective. And then uh, the, lastly, I want to discuss why the distinction between comparing a modern day enemy to a Malik and identifying them with a Malik is important. Okay. Uh, for his context purposes, uh, we, uh, what day are we in, in the war? 20 or 20, 21, 22? We're in the middle of the, uh, you know, the war between Israel and uh, Hamas. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about comparing Hamas to a Malik. Um, I want to make it very clear, and I'll say this many times throughout this year, Hamas is evil. We must destroy Hamas. But that does not mean that Hamas is a Malik. OK, uh, that's going to be the, uh, the 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 trend here. OK, so those are the objectives and the non objectives. OK, any questions before we start? <laughs> OK, all right. So let's quickly read through the Pesukim because they're very, uh, very short. Uh, Amalek is only really um, uh, the nation of Amalek is really described in two Pesukim in the Chumash or two uh, uh, Parshios in the Chumash. First is in Beshalach in uh, Shemos Yud Zion Ches through, Yud, uh, through uh, Tes Zion. Um, so it says, I'm just going to read in English here uh, until we get to the the uh, Pesukim. So Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rafidim. This is after Yamsuf. Moshe said to Yoshua, choose men and go out, fight against Amalek tomorrow. I will stand at the top of the hill with the staff of Hashem in my hand. Yoshua did as Moshe said to him to fight against Amalek. 
Uh, and Moshe and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. When Moshe would raise his hand, Israel prevailed. And when he would lower his hand, Amalek would prevail. The hands of Moshe were heavy. They took a stone and placed it under him, and he sat upon it. Uh, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on this side and one on that. And his hands were steadfast until the sun set. Yeshua weakened Amalek and his people by the edge of the sword. Hashem said to Moshe, now here's the part uh, where we get to... Um, for generations, the Hashem el Moshe, Hashem said to Moshe, "Kasov zos zikaron b'sefer." Write this as a memorial in the book. Okay, unclear what book that is. V'sim ba'ozni Yehoshua and uh, place it in the ears of Yehoshua. Sorry, uh, Alex, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, seems like everyone else's uh, connection is not bad. Uh, I don't know what to say. Um, I can give you a. Let me pause this for one second. Okay, anyway, um, so place it in the years of Yeshua, ki macho emche ezech amalek mitachas v'shemayim, um, for I will surely wipe out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heavens. Okay, so that is Hashem's statement. Okay, ki macho emche ezech amalek mitachas v'shemayim. We don't learn any halacha from that. Okay, uh, then vayivin Moshe mizbeach, um, vayikrash mo ar Hashem nisi, Moshe built an altar and named it Hashem is my banner. Uh, and then vayomer, and he said, uh, it's unclear who's speaking here, he said, he said, for a hand is on the throne of yod of God of God's throne, a war for God against Amalek uh, from generation to generation. Okay, so that's the end of the initial uh, encounter with Amalek. And then in uh, Devarim in uh, Kisete, I think, Devarim uh, Chafei yod through yod we have the mitzvahs of Amalek. So this is what we read uh, to fulfill the mitzvah of remembering Amalek. Remember what Amalek did to you on your journey after you left Egypt. Uh, how he happened upon you uh, on, the, on, the, on the way, on the path. He struck at all the weak ones at your rear. And you were famished and weary. And didn't fear God. It will be that when Hashem your God gives you a reprieve from all of your enemies that surround you, in the land that Hashem your God gives you as an inheritance to possess, you shall wipe out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heavens. Do not forget. Okay, and that's where we learn all the mitzvahs of Amalek from. Okay, now uh, let's switch to Rambam. Okay. Ramam codifies these in the Mishnah Torah in Hilko's Malachim Umilhamos, the laws of kings and wars, which is the last section of the Mishnah Torah. And there are really five mitzvahs that we're going to be um, uh, that are going to be relevant to our uh, situation here, our, our discussion. One is Lahacharim Shiva Amamin, to wipe out or to eradicate the seven nations. Okay, those are the Canaanite nations. Seven Lahacharios Mehen Neshama, not to allow any one of their souls to live. Eight Limchos Zaroshal Amalek to eradicate the offspring or the seed of Amalek. Nine, Lizkor Masha Asa Amalek to remember what Amalek did. Uh, and ten, Shlolish Koach Masav Haraim Ba'arivasa Baderach, not to forget his evil actions, Amalek's evil actions, and his ambush on the way. Okay, and if you read this in the uh, list of mitzvahs at the beginning of the Mishnah Torah, um, I just want to read the formulation there. So in mitzvahs, I say it's uh, Kufpe Zion. To wipe out the seven nations from the land of Israel. Shinemar, as it says, you should wipe them out. Uh, to uh, cut off the offspring of Amalek. Shinemar, as it says, you should wipe out the memory of Amalek. Uh, to remember what Amalek did constantly. Shinemar, as it says, to remember what Amalek did. And then in the Los Asses, um is um oh i'm missing one hold on lahachayos yeah memtes shaloha lahachayos adam yeshiva amamin not to allow any one of the any person of the seven nations to live shnemaraz says lo tachaya kol neshama and then uh amalek is nuntes shalo yasur milibenu maase amalek harash asalanu not to allow the uh, to remove from our heart the deed of Amalek, his evil deed that he did to us. Shnemar, as it says, Lotishkach. Okay, so those are the five five mitzvahs here. Okay, and I'm going to read to you the Rambam, and then I'm going to read to you the position that is ascribed to Ramosha Solvechik, which this year is going to aim to uh, to um, to correct. Okay, um, so we're going to read from the mitzvah of the seven nations because that's uh, part of where Ramosha gets his his position from. So mitzvah to say. 
Uh, this is in Malachim Umuchamos 5 4. Actually, I'm going to read from 5 1. In Hamelach Nilham Tchila Ela Milchamis Mitzvah. A king can only first engage in a a mitzvah war, okay, before he engages in an optional war. What is a mitzvah war? So there's three types of mitzvah wars. Zomil Chemes Shiva Amamin, the war of the seven nations, okay, that's to eradicate the seven nations. Two, Milchemes Amalek, uh, is the war against Amalek. And three, the Ezra Yisrael Mitzar Shiva Alehim, helping Israel uh, to save them from an enemy that comes upon them. So those are all mitzvah wars. Then he can engage in an optional war. Uh, and that is a war that is waged with other nations, meaning not Amalek and not the seven nations, in order to expand the boundaries of Israel and to increase its glory and reputation. Okay. So um, then he goes through how you declare war. And then he says what the war is with the seven nations. He says in Halacha Dalid. Um, mitzvah ase lahachrim shiv amamin. It is a positive mitzvah to uh, eradicate the seven nations. Shemaraz says hachrim tachrimim. You should surely uh, uh, eradicate them. V'chol shebal yado echad mehen below harago over below sase. Anyone who an individual of the seven nations comes to uh, his way and he doesn't kill him. Uh, transgresses a loss. It says, Lo you should not let any soul live. So again, it's an assay to wage war with them and a loss assay to allow them to live. Um, you know, we're, we're going to go through, uh, I mean, we're, we're not going to go through, sorry. There is a mitzvah to make overtures of peace. Okay. And, uh, and this is really if they don't uh, make peace with us. Okay. Um, but yeah, then he says, avdu they and their memory have already been lost. Okay, so that's going to be an important phrase. The chain, likewise, mitzvah say it is a positive mitzvah la abid zera amalek to wipe out the offspring of amalek. Shnemar, as it says, timcha ezeich armad, as it says, you shall wipe out the memory of amalek. So the Ramam is interpreting here when the Torah says wipe out the memory of amalek. You know, there's a a very like basic question that people ask is how can the Torah command us to wipe out the memory of amalek and have a mitzvah to remember amalek and to not forget. Right, seems like those mitzvahs are contradictory, right? So the Ram is saying, well, what does it mean to wipe out the memory of Amalek? It doesn't mean to wipe it out from our minds. It means because we, again, we have a prohibition to forget the memory of Amalek. It's a mitzvah to wipe out the Zera Amalek, the offspring of Amalek. It is a mitzvah to say to remember constantly the actions, the evil actions of Amalek and his uh, uh, ambush on the way. In order to arouse. Uh, enmity to arouse hatred towards Amalek. Shnemaraz it says, "Zahor esasher asalaka Amalek." You should remember what uh, Amalek did to you. Mipiyashmu alamdu from the Torah Bapeh. We learn Zahor Bapeh. Remember means verbally. You should verbally recollect, which we fulfill by reading it in the Sefer Torah on Parsha Zahor. And then Lotishkach Balev. Don't forget is in the heart. She also lishkoch evaso v'sinaso. It's also to forget uh, his uh, ambush and his hatred. Okay. So there you have the two halachos uh, that encompass, uh, um, you know, these five mitzvahs. Okay, so annihilate the seven nations and don't uh, allow them to live. And then wipe out the offspring of Amalek. Remember what they did and don't forget it. Okay, so uh, that is the uh, that is what the Ramam says. Okay, any questions so far before we get into the theory? Okay. So now we have what I'm going to call the theory of Rav Moshe Soloveitchik. Okay, now I am not aware of any place where Rav Moshe Soloveitchik... Oh, so just to go through the order really quickly. It's, um, it's Rav Chaim Soloveitchik is considered the founder of the Brisker Derech. His son is Rav Moshe Soloveitchik. And his son is uh, R- Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik, who we call the Rav. Okay, um, so I'm not aware of any place where Rav Moshe Soloveitchik has written this down. I'm only aware of this being taught in Rav Moshe Soloveitchik's name, in the name of the Rav, okay, of Rav Joseph Soloveitchik, okay? Now, I've seen people ascribe this to Rav Chaim Soloveitchik, but I haven't seen that either, and whenever the Rav talks about it, he he, call, he attributed it to his father, so I assume that this originated with Rav Moshe Soloveitchik. Um, the, I believe, the most direct authoritative source for this is um, the Rav in his essay, Kol Dodi Do Fake, which was originally written in Hebrew, uh, and was translated into English by several people. I'm reading from uh, Fate and Destiny, which is the translation by Lawrence Kaplan, who is the translator of Halakhic Man. Um, and it is the very end. It's the last footnote. Okay. 
Um, and I'm going to read that in English here. I have a copy of the Hebrew, but I didn't want to read the whole thing in English and in Hebrew. Um, so I can send it to you if you're interested. Um, I did uh, check out the uh, the key lines and uh, uh, the uh, I, uh, the translation. Uh, not that Lawrence Kaplan needs my uh, my uh, uh, authentication, but I, I think it's a good translation. Okay. Maimonides' Laws of Kings and Their Wars, 5.4, which we just read, writes the following regarding the seven nations of Canaan. It is a positive commandment to destroy the seven nations, as it is said, but thou shalt utterly destroy them. If one does not kill any of them that falls into one's power, one transgresses a negative commandment. As it is said, thou shalt save nothing that breatheth, um, but their memory has long since perished. The Radvaz, so that's the end of the quote of the Rambam, the Radvaz in his commentary, um, uh, on that place, notes that the source for Maimonides' concluding comment, but their memory has long since perished, is the statement of Rabbi Yoshua in Mishnah Yadaim 4.4. Sancheriv, king of Assyria, came up and intermingled all the peoples. Okay, so let's actually pause and read what he's talking about here. Okay, um, so that's the Radvaz who says... Um, so he quotes this Mishnah in Yadaim. So the Mishnah in Yadaim says, oh, I got a lot of fl sources floating around here. Yeah. Okay. So there's a Mishnah in Yadaim that says, uh, this is a Yadaim 4 4. Bo ba yom ba so the, the context here is that there are, um, we'll read it in the Mishnah, but there are several uh, prohibitions um, governing people from other nations converting or marrying into the Jewish people. Okay. Um, so, uh, so that's what the subject is here. Boba Yom Ba Yehuda. So Yehuda came, Ger Amoni, um, a, uh, an Ammonite convert, the Amad Lifnehem, the Vesa Midrash, and he came before them in the base Midrash. Amr Lahem, he said to them, uh, so this Ger said, Ma'ani Labo Bakal, can I enter into the congregation in marriage? Amr Lo Rabbi Gamliel, Asr Atta. Rabbi Gamliel says, it is Asr for you to enter. Amr Lo Rabbi Yoshua, Rabbi Yoshua said, Mutter Atta, you are permitted to marry in. Amr lo Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Gamliel said to him, Hakasuv Omer lo yavo amoni umuavi b'kahal arshem gam dor asiri. Uh, he says, uh, it, it, uh, an Ammonite and a Moabite may not enter into the congregation of Hashem, even the 10th generation. Okay, so it's Usser, uh, everyone holds it's Usser for an Ammonite and a Moabite man who converts to marry into the Jewish people. Okay, he can marry a uh, um, another Ger or a, a Mamzer. Um, uh, Amr lo, so so that's Rabbi Gamliel's argument. So how can you say that he can come into the congregation uh, in marriage if it says that he can't? Amr lo, Rabbi Yoshua, Rabbi Yoshua said, Are the Ammonites and the Moabites still in their locales? Kvar Allah Sancheriv Melech Ashur Ubil Bel Eskola Umos. Sancheriv, the king of Assyria, um, already came up and um, literally confused all of the nations. Shnei it says, Ba'asir Gvulos Amim Va'asodosehem Okay, I uh, uh, I'm gonna just look this up in. Actually, I'm gonna get. Sorry, I'm gonna get the uh, Tanakh and just read the, the translation here. Okay, ten thirteen. Um, Ten thirteen says, um, for he said, with the strength of my hand, I have accomplished and with my wisdom, for I'm understanding, I have removed the boundaries of peoples and have plundered the treasures. I have brought dwellers in strongholds. OK, so my understanding is basically what Sancheriv did is he wanted in order to exert his power. He basically uprooted people from their local uh, uh, locations and, and did like forced relocation and assimilation, kind of like uh, what, you know, the United States did with some um, indigenous peoples, uh, like forcibly relocating them and then try to like, you know, take away their uh, their power. OK, um, so uh, so that's what he holds. That's what Rabbi Yeshua holds. Amr lo Rabbi Gamliel, Hakasu of Omer, the Pasuk says, V'afrechein ashiv es shivus. Okay, you know, this is not relevant here. Okay, so the question is, what, what, what does that mean? So the Ramam on the Mishnah explains, because the nations were mixed up in the time of Sancheriv, as is uh, uh, publicized in the books of prophecy, he moved nations from one end to the other of the earth. Therefore, the families, the tribes of these nations to us are concealed. We cannot learn out um, a proof from their locations. It's known that halakhically of the 70 nations, 
all nations who convert can marry into the Jewish people, except for Ammon and Moab, Egypt and Edom. Okay. Um, uh, with Ammon and Moab, they can never marry in. And then Egypt and Edom, there's a restriction on the, the third generation can, uh, can marry in. Because we have a principle, this is a principle in halakhic probability assessment, okay, that we assume that any individual member that separates from a mixed group that individual member comes from the majority. Okay, so like the classic case is, and don't go uh, rely on this halakhically, if you have a uh, nine pieces of kosher meat and one piece of treif meat, and they all become mixed together, and then one of them, uh, let's say they're indistinguishable, and then one of them becomes separated, you can assume that it came from the majority, and so you assume that it came from the kosher one. So to here, um, you have uh, Ammonites and Moabites and, and Egyptians and, and Edomites that became intermingled among the rest of humanity. And we know that they're there, but we know that they're a minority portion. So any individual who comes uh, from uh, the, the populace of non-Jews, we assume that they came from the non-Ammonite, Moabite, Egyptian, and Edomite population. The Alcane, therefore, we could permit them to enter into the community uh, immediately. And the Ramam Paskins like this halakhically. I'm just going to read the same thing from the Mishnah Torah. He says in Isuribia 1225, uh, when Sancherev, the king of Assyria, went up, uh, he intermingled the nations uh, with each other and the Hegla Osami Mukoman, he exiled them from their place. The Eluha Mitzrim, Shabarish Mitzrayim Mata, the Egyptians who are in Egypt now, Anashim Acherim Haim, they're other people. Okay, nowadays they're Arabs. I don't know who they were in the Ramam's time. Um, the Edomites in the field of Edom, same thing. Um, since these four nations became that are prohibited, became mixed into the other nations of the world that are permitted, Hutur Hakol, all of them are now permitted. Anyone who steps forth from them to convert, the assumption is that they've come from the majority. Therefore, anyone who converts nowadays. Ben Edomi, Ben Mitri, Ben Amoni, Ben Moavi, Ben Kushi, Ben Sharha Umos, whether he is um, Edomite, Egyptian, Ammonite, Moabite, uh, Ethiopian, or any other nation, male or female, Mutarm Lavo Bukamiyad, they may come into, the, into marry into the community immediately. So basically, all of the halakhic restrictions on marriage that are ethnic. We no longer know how to identify those ethnicities, and we assume that they come from the majority and that they're permitted. And that law about marrying into the congregation is the basis, according to the Radvaz, of the Rambam saying about the seven nations that they have already been uh, lost and their memory has been lost, which means, yeah, maybe out there, there is a member, there's a Canaanite somewhere that intermingled, and if you use a 23andMe uh, and you find the uh, Canaanite DNA, like you can identify them, but they've already intermingled a lot and we can't just identify them by their place. Okay, so for all intents and purposes, they're no longer around. Okay. Any questions on that? Because that's going to be a big, uh, important part of this pillar here, pillar of this uh, view. Okay, so 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 far so good. Okay, now we get to the crux of Ramosha Soloveitchik's uh, theory. He says, so this is the Rav in Kolda Dito Fake. It is, however, striking and passing strange that Maimonides, in sending forth the commandment to wipe out a Malik, does not add the concluding phrase, quote, but their memory has long since perished. Okay, so uh, again, looking at the halachos here, after the mitzvah of the seven nations, which is halacha four, he concludes by saying their memory, uh, they've been lost and their memory has been lost. But with Amalek, in halacha five, he does not conclude that way by saying that they've been lost and their memory is lost. So what do we infer from there? So the Rav says, um, thus states Maimonides in Laws of Kings and Their Wars 5.5, five, similarly, it is a positive commandment to destroy the remembrance of Amalek, as it is said, thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek. It is also a positive commandment to remember always his evil deeds and his waylaying, uh, the waylaying he resorted to, so that we keep afresh the hatred manifested by him, as it is said, remember what Amalek did to, unto thee in Devarim 25.17. The traditional interpretation of the injunction is remember by word of mouth, not forget out of mind, that is that it is forbidden to forget his hatred and enmity, end quote from the Rambam. So here's the Rav's inference. It would appear from Maimonides' statements that Amalek is still in existence, while the seven nations have descended into the abyss of oblivion. So again, Halakha 4 about the seven nations, the Ramam concludes by saying that they've been lost and their memory has been lost, which means that they're gone. But Amalek, the Ramam does not conclude that. So the Rav is saying, it would seem from the Ramam, that Amalek is still uh, at large. Okay, still around. Okay, so now comes the inference. 
Oh, sorry. For, now comes the question. One may query, why didn't Maimonides apply Rabbi Yeshua's principle that Sancheriv, king of Assyria, came up and intermingled all the peoples to Amalek as he did to the seven nations? The answer to this question is very simple. Scripture testifies that Amalek is still in existence. Note what the Torah states uh, in Beshalach. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to, gen to generation. Um, if that is the case, then it is impossible that Amalek can be uh, that Amalek be completely destroyed before the coming of Mashiach. As the sages state, the divine throne will not be whole until the divine name, sorry, and the divine name will not be whole until the descendants of Amalek are completely blotted out. That's Midrash Tanhuma on Kisete at the end and Rashi on Exodus 17, 16. But where is he? Okay, so that's the question. Now, where is Amalek? Now here comes Rav Moshe Soloveitchik's Svara. I once heard the following answer from my father and master, Rav Moshe Soloveitchik of blessed memory, namely, that any nation that conspires to destroy Knesset Yisrael becomes, according to the halacha, Amalek. Okay, let me repeat that. Any nation that conspires to destroy Knesset Yisrael becomes, according to the halacha, Amalek. My father and master added, we have been charged with two commandments concerning Amalek. The first is the obligation to blot out his memory. This obligation devolves upon every person with reference to an individual Amalekite and is set forth in the verse, thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek. The second is the readiness to do battle as a community against the people of Amalek. This requirement is set forth in the verse, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Thus, if any peoples seeks to destroy us, we are commanded to do battle against it when it rises up against us. And this battle of ours is an obligatory war, a Muhammad's mitzvah on the basis of the verse from Exodus. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. However, the obligation to wipe out individual Amalekites as set forth in the verse from Deuteronomy applies only to genealogical descendants of Amalek. Okay. Now, it is true that Maimonides' ruling also includes the obligation to blot out individuals, an obligation which does not apply to any nation other than Amalek, even if that nation seeks to destroy the Jewish people. And this obligation is no longer in force since there are no longer any identifiable genealogical descendants of Amalek. Nevertheless, since the obligation to do battle against Amalek as a people would apply to such a nation, Maimonides did not use the phrase, but since Amalek's memory has long since perished. Um, there still exists a category of Amalek as a people, even now after the peoples have been intermingled, uh, and there are no longer any individual Amalekites. People honking outside. Can you hear that? Okay, sorry. Um, perhaps the above is the basis for the ruling of Maimonides in the Laws of Kings and Their Wars 5.1, that a defensive war waged by the Jewish people against an aggressor is an obligatory war. Such a war falls under the rubric of the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. To be sure, Maimonides in his ruling singles out the war against Amalek for special mention, which would indicate that the war against Amalek and a defensive war against an aggressor are two separate categories. Nevertheless, one may maintain that a war waged by the Jewish people against an aggressor who seeks to destroy it still belongs to the category of the war against Amalek. Okay, note carefully the sugya in Sota 44b, uh, Dibur Maskil Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Okay, so in short, the takeaway here is that Rav Moshe Soloveitchik holds that, um, so the question is, why is it that the Rambam um, does not say in his presentation of Amalek, Kvar Avdu Vavad Zehram, that they and their memory have perished, must be that there is a form of Amalek that still is around, and that can't be referring to the uh, the ethnic biological Amalek because they got mixed up with Sanhedrin. It must be that there is another type of Amalek. What is that Amalek? It is any nation that seeks out to eradicate the Jewish people. Um, and, uh, and there we have an obligation not as individuals to kill individual Amalekites, but to go to war as a community with that Amalek and to wipe them out. And that he's not learning from... Uh, Timcha Ezecher Amalek, he's learning that from Milchama Ladashem Ba'amalek Mi Dor Dor, that it, there's a war against Amalek uh, um, uh, from generation to generation. Okay, um, so that is the how the Rav wrote uh, his father's view in Kol Dodido Fake. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, um, I also want to point out that, that that's not the only place where this is written. So Rav Moshe Shirkin in Harare Kedem Volume 1, Simon Reish Tess, uh, also uh, writes this in Bedin Machias Amalek. Um, so he says, I'm just going to read it in, in his formulation here. He says, so he's writing as the Rav, okay, even though he's based on notes from the Rav. That's actually the, the Rav's words in Kodo Dito Fake, that any nation that conspires um, 
to annihilate the, the congregation of uh, uh, of Israel transforms halachically into a malik. And we are obligated in the mitzvah of wiping out a malik in two mitzvahs. To wipe out the memory of a malik. That's the pasuk in Devarim. That's the one mitzvah on every individual to wipe out the offspring of a malik. The second one is to go to war as a nation with a Malik, uh, that's the one in Parshas Peshalach, that there is a war between Hashem and Amalek from generation to generation. The entire con- congregation is obligated to go to war with uh, with the Amalekite nation. That mitzvah is not just on the offspring of Amalek. Um, that is um, uh, any uh, nation that goes uh, that rises against us to destroy us. We are commanded to go to war with it, and that is a milchamas mitzvah. Mash enki mitzvahs machias amalek shal kol yachiv yachid hamur beparshas kisete in ela zera amalek bilvad. But the individual mitzvah to wipe out individual amalekites in parshas kisete that's only individual amalekites alone. Okay, so that is Rav uh, view. Okay, now. Um, these are not the only places where the Rav says this. There's this book called The Rav Thinking Aloud, which is by Rabbi David Holzer, which was um, based on recordings of conversations with the Rav. And there he asked the Rav point blank um, on page uh, 165. So they're talking about Nazism. Okay. And uh, he says, so David Holzer says Nazism was a movement. And the Rav says, sure. David Holzer says, but a movement can be pure evil. The Rav says their their ideal was immorality. Nazism wanted to change. Nazism was not just a political movement, but an ideological movement that wanted to change the whole moral code, the whole philosophy of man. Here, they, the PLO, wanted a country, but the strong desire for their country, for Palestine, is now responsible for the emergence of a new type of terrorist. All terrorists have basically an ideal. David Holzer says, but the equation to Nazism is still there, despite the fact that, and then he's cut off, uh, the Rav says, as far as the Jews are concerned, W. Holter says, well, for us, since the way the Rav described it, since they raised a banner to destroy, Rav says, they are a Malik. W. Holter repeats, they are a Malik. The Rav says, I wouldn't say all Palestinians, but to those organized Palestinians, Yasser Arafat and his company, of course they're a Malik, no doubt about that. Okay, so that seems to be saying that the Rav is saying that that these organized Palestinians of Yasser Arafat back then, the ones who were like, you know, uh, trying to wipe out Israel, uh, that those are Amalek, okay? So this is the basis for people, uh, many people I know in my yeshiva, who think that that uh, that that Hamas, who definitely wants to wipe out Israel and wants to wipe out the Jews, is halakhically Amalek according to uh, the, the Rambam, okay? This whole thing that we've just said until now is the basis of them saying that, um, and that is what I want to uh, to challenge. Okay, so any questions before I challenge it? <laughs> okay, but I have more so comment. <laughs> yes, sure, go ahead. It's just me. wild the way that this. When, when was this written specifically? I don't know if you know offhand. Uh, which one, the Coldo Dito fake or the interview with the Rav? The interview. Um, the interview with the Rav. Uh, I can tell you the range of years. Uh, it was actually maybe I can't. I don't know offhand. Uh, it was well, it was over a range of six years. Okay, but uh, I don't know which years those were. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the comment is more so like I'm just thinking about. It's wild that we see this written probably like 50 years ago, and how they're around that time and how it's kind of complementing what's happening today. And the sense that history is not like repeating itself, but still we see these patterns that are happening. It's like chill inducing for me to like be learning about this now. It is. Yeah. I'm having the same feeling when I read a lot of stuff about, you know, uh, of earlier uh, periods of time. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I think think we're not the only ones. Yeah. Okay. So um, once again, I have no problem. Okay. Well, not no problem. (laughs) <laughs> for the purposes of this year, I have no problem if, if someone wants to say that that a Malik is an ideology as their own independent shita. Okay. For example, um I saw in the um uh I was trying to trace back what oops sorry, what the um 
what the earliest um, claim is that Amalek halakhically is an ideology. So Chacham Fa'or in Appendix 25 of the Horizontal Society um, has a quote from, uh, or position from Rav Yitzchak Abu Lafia, who lived from 1824 to 1910, uh, which can be found in the Pnei Yitzchak Volume 6 in Shabbat Zahor 41a, which I have a copy of, um, where he he has a whole analysis of Amalek, and he concludes, he says, um, this is uh, Faor's translation of Rabbi Abu Lafia, from the proceeding we have learned that a people who become infamous because of the manner in which they conducted their attack against the Jewish people were designated Amalek. This identification may take place even in our own days when people that are ethnically mixed and cannot be identified ethnically as Amalek. And at any rate, once they are identified as Amalek because of their behavior, they are one and the same with Amalek, and to eradicate them will constitute, in fact, erasing the name of Amalek. So he makes the argument that um, that any group that identifies with Amalek and wants to eradicate the Jewish people uh, is uh, has the din of Amalek. Now, he, I'm t if someone wants to say that that is their halakhic opinion in general, more power to them, okay? My sole objection is saying that this is what the Rambam holds, okay? I do not believe it's possible to hold that the Rambam says this, okay? So I'm going to give you a couple arguments, okay, that the Rambam cannot hold that Amalek is an ideology or uh, uh, or anything other than an, an ethnicity, okay? And a lot of these arguments I get from, um, yeah, Tamar? Sorry, just to clarify, sure. but can you hear me? Sorry about the yeah, background I can hear you, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, are you saying that this, are you arguing with the, with, uh, the Muslim salvation, or are you saying a power of Muslim salvation, you're saying either? So I'm going to set forth two possibilities. Okay, first, I'm going to argue that this can't be what the Rambam is saying. And now the question is, what did Ramosha Soloveitchik mean? And I think there are only two possibilities. Either he meant what he said, and he's wrong, or he didn't mean it the way he said it. Okay, he meant it as a drush. He meant it rhetorically. He didn't mean it halakhically. Um, and I'm inclined to say that he meant it as a drush. Okay, I, I, because I, to me, it's being Don Lakov's Lewis. I, I don't want to say that Ramosha Soloveitchik is wrong and that he just doesn't know how to read Rambam. Okay, and to me, like, there's certain areas where, like, you know, you can see that there's room for multiple svaras. You know, here, I just don't think there's any room for reading the Rambam this way. Okay, so I, I don't want to say that he's wrong. I just want to say that that that's not what he um that's not that's not what he meant. Okay, and I also want to say that that's not what the Rav meant. Okay. So um, I think the best way to do this, actually, so I don't have to use my own authority for this, is I'm going to read through Rav Nachum Rabinovich. Okay, he wrote uh, in a book called Milumare Milchama. Um, in this edition, so it's volume three. In this edition, is page twenty-two, section three, called Geder Mitzvahs Mechias Amalek. And I think we'll just read through this. Um, it's only uh, two pages and then some. Um, and uh, and let him make the argument, okay? Instead of resting it on me. Now, Rav Nachman Ravinaj is the is the author of the Yad Pshuta, which is, in my opinion, the best modern commentary on the Rambam on the Mishnah Torah. He was a Rambam scholar. He was a posik, um, and uh, and he uh, definitely knows how to learn Rambam. Okay, so um, what year was he? Like he was he died in two thousand six, I think. Nachum Rabinovich. Um, uh, 1928 to 2000, oh, 2020, sorry, I'm getting him mixed up with another, another person, he died in 2020, okay, um, if any of you know, uh, Rabbi Yoni Rosenzweig, I believe Rabbi Yoni Rosenzweig was a Talmud, uh, of Rav Nachman Rabinovich, okay, uh, who, who, you know, they're both post him. <clears throat> okay, so, question was posted. him, Raisi Besefer Drashos Shaha Grid Soloveitchik, Shlita, so he wrote this when the Rav was still alive, he says, I saw in a book of Drashos of the Rav, okay, uh, now corrected to Zatzal. Shemevi Shemevi Beheara Bishem Avi Pagon Rav Moshe Zatzal. Shekol Hakam Al Am Yisrael Lasos Bo Milchama Dino Ka Amalek L'Chol Davar. That um that he wrote in a footnote in the name of his father Rav Moshe. This is what we just read. That anyone who rises against Klal Yisrael to wage war with them has the status of a Malik. Shuv Shemati Mi Shomer Kain Gam Bishem Ha Rav. Okay, I meant to look this up. Okay, Rav Cook. His name was Rav Avraham Yitzchak Cook. Okay. His son, I just, I want to make sure I'm talking about the right Rav Cook. Rav Avraham Yitzchak Cook, son. Uh, Rav Tzvi Yehuda Cook. Okay, yeah. So I think this is Rav Tzvi Yehuda Cook. Rav Tzvi Yehuda Cook, yeah. So, so he says, I also heard in the name of Rav Tzvi Yehuda Cook, that's all. Uh, so you heard the same thing, okay? 
Um, Some say that the Rav and Rav Svi Hudakuk only said this by way of drush. Okay, drush for our purposes means non halachic speech. Ah, lo lipsak halacha, right? Uh, not not lipsok halacha, not not as a ruling. Ma who ma hadin bakah? What is the uh, what is the din for this? Okay, what is the uh, what, what 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 do you think about this? Okay, so he says like this. Um, Rav Nachman Rav Benrich says haramam kasav dvarim berurim v'chad mashmaim. Okay, so the Ramam writes statements that are clear and unequivocal, okay, in the more Nebuchim. Okay, so we're going to switch here to le learning this inside, okay? So last week in my article, I wrote a article about the genealogies in Parshas Noah. Okay, this is in the more Nebuchim 350. The Ramam says, there are things that belong to the mysteries of the Torah, which have caused many people to stumble, which therefore ought to be examined. These are the stories recounted in the Torah, the telling of which is thought to be useless. As, for instance, the account of branching out of tribes from Noah and of their names and dwelling places. Likewise, the sons of Seir HaKhori, okay, the account of the kings that reigned in the land of Edom and the like. Okay, so the question basically is, what do you do with these portions of the Torah that seem like they're useless, just like lists of names, okay? So he says, um, he says, uh, as for me, I will inform you of a general principle, uh, and then I shall come back to the details. So the Ram gives us a principle about how to interpret these things. So he says like this, know that all the stories you will find mentioned in the Torah occur there for a necessary Torah related reason, either to affir affirm a true idea, which is one of the foundations of Torah, or to rectify some action so that a mutual wrongdoing and aggression should not occur between men. So in other words, when you see these sections, not just these sections, any section in Torah, is only there for one of two reasons, either to teach you a Torah fundamental or to prevent some wrongdoing from occurring. Okay. So he says, I shall set this forth to you in an orderly fashion. So I'll explain everything. So he goes and he explains why the genealogy of Noah is there. I wrote about that last week. And then he explains why it talks about certain things by Sodom. Okay. Then he says, why is it that all of the offspring of Esau have to be enumerated? He says, the enumeration of the tribes of the children of Seir and of their individual genealogy is made with a view to one single commandment. Okay, so in other words, all of the genealogy of Esau's descendants is there just for the purposes of one mitzvah. For he, may he be exalted, commanded us exterminating only the offspring of Amalek. Okay, there you go. Now, Amalek was the son of Eliphaz and Timnah, the sister of Lotan. He's quoting from that genealogy. He did not command killing the other children of Esau. Now, Esau was connected by marriage with the children of Seir, as set forth in the text. He had issue from them, meaning he had offspring from them, and reigned over them, and his descendants mingled with theirs. Consequently, the whole land of Seir and those tribes were called after the predominant tribe, namely the children of Esau, and particularly the descendants of Amalek, for they were the bravest among them. Accordingly, if there had been no explanation concerning these genealogies and their particulars, all of them would have been killed through neglectfulness. Consequently, Scripture explained their tribes and said that those whom you see today in Seir and the kingdom of Amalek are not all of them the children of Amalek, but some of them are descendants of this or that individual and are only called after Amalek because the latter's mother belonged to them. All this was an act of justice on the part of God, lest a tribe be killed indiscriminately in the course of the extermination of another tribe. For the decree was only directed against the descendants of Amalek, and we have already explained in what way wisdom was manifest therein. Okay, so what the Raman is saying is why does the Torah need to waste so much space to do a detailed genealogy of Amalek's descendants and Seir and the people who were living there so that you don't accidentally kill an Arab tribe thinking that it's Amalek? Because if you didn't know which one was Amalek, you just err on the side of caution or you say, oh, these guys are victimizing us, we should kill them. But no, no, no. God does not want there to be a uh, an unjust killing of someone who is not Amalek under the guise of the mitzvah of Amalek. The decree was only directed against the descendants of Amalek. And when he says, uh, we've explained how, I think he's referring to earlier in the morning book in 341, he says, um, the book of Judges also includes the commandment to destroy the seed of Amalek. For one particular tribe or nation ought to be punished, just as one individual is punished, so that all tribes should be deterred and should not cooperate in doing evil. For they will say, lest be done to us what was done to the sons of such and such a man. Thus, even if there should grow up among them a wicked, corrupt man who does not care about the wickedness of his soul and does not think of the wickedness of his action, he will not find a helper on his own tribe, of his own tribe to help him in the wicked things whose realization he desires. Accordingly, it was commanded that Amalek, who hastened to use the sword, should be exterminated by the sword. 
On the other hand, Amun and Moab, who acted in a vile manner and caused harm by means of a stratagem, were punished only by the prohibition against becoming related to them through marriage by being considered worthless and by their friendship being shunned. All these matters belong to the divine estimation of penalties so that there should not be too great or too small, so that they should be, these should not be too great or too small, as he may he... he May he be exalted, has made it clear, according to his wickedness, uh, according to the wickedness of the tribe uh, of the person should you punish them. So in other words, Amalek um, was quick to use the sword, and then God basically wanted to make a lesson out of Amalek um, as a deterrent uh, against other tribes, okay? So it was just that one, you know, you mess with us, this is what you get, okay? Um, so it was meant to be a deterrent against other people from killing us, but the decree was only on Amalek themselves, Okay. So that's what Rav Rabinovich uh, writes. Uh, he quotes that whole parak in the Mor uh, He's quoting in Hebrew here. And he emphasizes, Okay. So in the Sefer HaMitzvos, which the Ramam um, was the first thing the Ramam wrote, how does he formulate the mitzvah? He says the mitzvah is to annihilate the offspring of Amalek alone from among all the other tribes of Asaph. Now, if the Rama meant that you should kill anyone who rises up against us, well, we've had lots of uh, people from the from the Bnei Asaph that that rose up against us to kill us. Okay, um, and uh, you know, most uh, I mean, in Tanakh, you have the uh, the you know uh, the Edomites, right? Um, Esau who Edom, you know, but no, it's not all of them. It's just Amalek. Okay. And, uh, so that's in the Sefer Mitzvos. Um, and, uh, he says, Ella Shalachora. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I also want to, um, point out here. Okay. This is, you know, I'm always harping on how you should make sure that you use a, a correct version of the, of the Mishnah Torah. Okay. So there are versions of the Mishnah Torah that say in the Halakha of, uh, Muhammad's Pachin Mitzvos, I say La'abid. So there are, in the standard versions of the Mishnah Torah, it says the mitzvah I say is to wipe out the memory of Amalek, okay? But in the authentic versions of the Mishnah Torah, it says the Zera Amalek, okay? So he keeps on using the term Zera. Uh, again, he uses that. We saw in the in the Koseris at the beginning of the Halachos, Zaro Shal Amalek. In the beginning of uh, the Mishnah Torah, Lahakris, Zaro Shal Amalek. So this is all about the descendants of Amalek. Okay, now... Now Rabinovich uh, addresses the question about the uh, uh, that prompted the Rav's footnote. So what about in Hilchos Malachim, where he says he quotes the Mitzvah say Lahachrim Shiva Amamin Shinemar Hachrim Tachrim Ukvar Ava Zichran. Okay, the memory of the seven nations has already been lost. Oh, that's, this is using a wrong version also. Shinemar Timcha Ezechar Amalek. By the seven nations, he says, their memory has already been lost. Why didn't the Ramam say this about Amalek? Hasn't Amalek also been um, uh, uh, mixed in among the nations and lost? Okay, so now he's addressing the Rav's question. Okay, so again, we, we make sure we understand the question here. Um, uh, because if you don't understand the question, you're not going to understand the answer. So just to go through again, by the seven nations in Halachas 4, he says that they've already been lost and their memory's been lost, but by Amalek, he doesn't say that. And the Rav infers from there, based on his father, that 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 Amalek is still alive and well. Okay? We're clear? Okay. So now Rav Rabinovich is going to answer it based on a Rambam in the Sefer HaMitzvos. Okay. He says, Ulam Rabinu Samach Amashabir, but Orech Besefer Mitzvos, Ase Kufpe Zayin, Shisham Hirthiv Hadibor Lahasbir Inyan Nohig Ladoros. Okay, so Ramam in the Sefer Mitzvos uh, has uh, 14 rules for what can and cannot be counted as one of Taryag Mitzvos. Okay, one of the rules is if there was a mitzvah that only applied for a specific period in history, uh, then um, then it cannot be counted. But if it is a mitzvah that's no Higladoros that applies throughout all of history, then it can be counted. So for example, B'nai Israel were not allowed to gather mun on Shabbos in the Midbar. Okay, that was a mitzvah. It was halachic. It was Doraisa, but it wasn't one of the 613 mitzvahs because uh, it, it didn't apply for all generations. Similarly, there was a mitzvah that when you, uh, you know, that when you hear, uh, you know, you should sound the shofar and summon uh, the, the group. Okay, that was during the Midbar, but not for all generations. Okay, 
So the Rambam in the Sefer Mitzvos writes as follows. This is Sefer Mitzvos 187, the law of the seven Canaanite nations. And I'm using Chevelle's translation here. By this injunction, we are commanded to exterminate the seven nations that inhabited the land of Canaan because they constituted the root and very foundation of idolatry. This injunction is contained in his words, thou shalt utterly destroy them. It is explained in many texts that the object was to safeguard us from imitating their apostasy. There are many passages in scripture which strongly urge and exhort us to exterminate them and war against them is obligatory. Okay, now he says like this, one might think that this commandment is not binding for all time, seeing that the seven nations have long ceased to exist. Okay, so what's his question? What's the what's the objection that someone might raise in your own words? Yeah, Tamar? It sounds like it's going against the rule for counting in. Sounds like it's going against the rule for counting mitzvahs, right? Sounds like if you can say, sounds like you could say that if you can say about any mish, mitzvah, mission accomplished, then that means it's only there for a limited time and it can't count as one of the mitzvahs, okay? So the Ram says though, but that opinion will be entertained only by one who has not grasped the distinction between commandments which are binding for all time and those which are not. A commandment which has been completely fulfilled by the attainment of its object, but to the fulfillment of which no definite time limit can be attached, cannot be said not to be binding for all time. Way too many negatives there. Okay, so, so let me say this in my own language here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and make a space here, even though the Roman doesn't have it. Okay, let me read that again, and I'll say it in my own language. A commandment which has been completely fulfilled by the attainment of its object, but to the fulfillment of which no definite time limit has been attached, cannot be said not to be binding for all time, because it is binding in every generation in which there is a possibility of its fulfillment. So I'm going to coin a new term here, okay? Um, I'm going to, a terminal mitzvah. Okay, which means a mitzvah that has a terminus, i.e. a completion point. Okay, so the Ramam's question here, I'll indent this so you know it's not the Ramam, even though it's clear that I'm taking notes. So the Ramam's question, or the question that the Ramam's articulating is he's saying, um, he's saying um, the mitzvah of annihilating the seven nations is a terminal mitzvah. Um, doesn't that go against your rule that terminal mitzvos uh, mitzvos can't be counted? So Ram's answer is you're misunderstanding the rule. Okay, a terminal mitzvah can be counted as long as the period given for its fulfillment is unlimited. Okay, so in other words. The mitzvah of wiping out the seven nations, if if God said you have to wipe out the seven nations within the first hundred years of the Mahus, then you couldn't count that. But if he says, no, wipe out the seven nations and it's an unbound mitzvah, the mitzvah can be finished. Yeah, that could be counted. Okay. So, he's, so, okay, so that, that's his argument. So let, let's read it again, see it in the words. A commandment which has been completely fulfilled by the attainment of its object, but to the fulfillment of which no definite time limit has been attached, cannot be said not to be binding for all time because it is binding in every generation in which there is a possibility of its fulfillment. Okay, so the, uh, so I'm just type this out here. So, so uh, I'll just, I'll just type out what I said, just so you can see it visually. Okay, so if the mitzvah to wipe out the seven nations, which is a terminal mitzvah, were given with a time limit on its completion, then it couldn't be part of Taryag. But the mere fact that it is a terminal mitzvah itself doesn't preclude it from being counted in Taryag. Okay? Any questions on that? Okay, so now the Ram is going to address a question. How do you know that you're right, Rambam? Okay, so what would the Ramam have to find in order, what, what model would the Ramam have to find in order to show that a mitzvah like the seven nations can be counted?
I'll, I'll write this out, okay? How, how does the Rambam know that such that a mitzvah like the seven nations can be counted okay maybe terminal mitzvos cannot be counted in taryag so what would the ram need to find in order to uh to show that such a mitzvah can be counted yeah tamar um i don't know i feel like you're you're heading towards a specific answer I don't really have anything super okay, clear, but so, yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say maybe like something that's definitely obviously a mitzvah that's also terminal. Exactly. The Raman would just need to find one example of a terminal mitzvah, okay, i.e., a mitzvah that can be totally completed and done, which is obviously counted. Okay. And if the Raman could say, here's a mitzvah that everyone holds as a mitzvah and it's terminal and we count it, so then I have proof that I can count the seven mitzvahs, uh, the, the seven nations. Okay. And guess what mitzvah the Ramam shows uh, that is terminal? Wiping out a Malik. Okay. So he says like this If the Lord completely, this is the Ramam back again, if the Lord completely destroys and exterminates the Amalekites, okay, and may this be come to pass speedily in our days in accordance with the promise, for I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek, okay. So if we say, uh, if the Lord completely um, destroys and exterminates the Amalekites, shall we then say that the injunction, thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek, is not binding for all time? Okay, so in other words, it, Amalek, we know, is a terminal mitzvah. How do we know it? Because God says it will be completed at some time, okay? So are you going to tell me that the fact that um, the mitzvah of wiping out Amalek can be completed means that we shouldn't count it in Taryag? Of course not. He says, we cannot say so. The injunction is binding for all time. As long as the descendants of Amalek exist, they must be exterminated. Similarly, in the case of the seven nations, their destruction and extermination is binding upon us, and the war against them is obligatory. We are obligated to root them out and pursue them throughout all the generations until they are destroyed completely. Thus, we did until their destruction was completed by David and their remnant was scattered and intermingled um, with the other nations so that no trace of them remains. But although they have disappeared, it does not follow that the commandment to exterminate them is not binding for all time, just as we cannot say that the war against the Malik is not binding for all time, even after they have been consumed and destroyed. No special condition of time or place is attached to this commandment, as is the case with the commandment specifically designated for the desert or for Egypt. On the contrary, it applies to those on whom it is imposed, and they must fulfill it so long as any of those against whom it is directed exists. So let me summarize this again. Okay. And it's very important for us to recognize the logic here. Okay. So uh, let me just actually make this into. Uh, um, bullet points for uh, for uh, OCD purposes. Okay, so again, from the top, um, the mitzvah of annihilating the seven nations is a terminal mitzvah. It can be finished. <laughs> Doesn't this go against the Ramam's view that terminal mitzvahs can be counted? Sorry, hold on a second. Still sick? <laughs> Okay, doesn't this go against the Ramos view that terminal mitzvahs can't be counted? Answer, your misunderstanding of the rule. A terminal mitzvah can be counted as long as the period is unlimited, okay? Um, question, how does the Ramam know that you can count those mitzvahs? Answer, if I find you a mitzvah that we is terminal and we all agree is a mitzvah, and then that would show that you can count the Sheva mitzvah, uh, the Sheva, uh, the seven nations. So that is a Malik, okay? This is a Malik, okay? A Malik is a terminal mitzvah, as we see from Hashem's, Hashem's promise that a Malik will one day be totally eradicated. Okay. And yet everyone holds that wiping out a Malik is a, uh, a, a mitzvah. So too, um, the seven nations is a terminal mitzvah. And we can count it as Taryag. Okay, any questions on that reasoning? Yeah, Ayala. So is the only reason that a Malik is more obvious than the seven nations that it would be counted because it's like straight out in the Pesukim? The, I, so I, the... it's a good question. Um, I, I think it might be, and I don't know for sure, it might be that people challenged the Ramam counting the Sheva Mitzvos, uh, sorry, the Sheva Mitzvos, the seven nations, uh, but... It just factually, no one challenges that a Malik has to be wiped out. 
Uh, I, that's my assumption. Okay. Yes, more. So I have a question, but it's not specifically on this reasoning. Can I ask it now or sure. should I wait? You can ask it now. Okay. Um, I, I got a little confused, I think, because it sounded like the original thing from the Rav and, and Rav Moshe Soloveitchik, it was breaking down the mitzvah into two parts, one that was like national war and one that was about yeah. individuals. Yeah. Um, and um, I feel like the the earlier thing that was brought in definitely disproved the thing about individuals. But are we addressing like the war comment or is that? Uh, like, we, I, I we, know how much yes, we will get yeah. to that point. Okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now what, what does this have to do with, um, and by the way, I realize she was going to go over time. So if you have to leave, go ahead and leave. Uh, I, I have this here in me and I need to get it out. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to keep going even if no one's here. Um, okay. So now the question though is, what does this have to do with, with, uh, with the statement about the seven, the seven nations that they've already been lost? All right, so check out this beautiful reasoning here. Okay, so Rav, um, Rabinovich quotes that whole thing. And he says like this, Kan mashve mitzvahs shiva amamin l'mitzvahs amalek. Here the Rambam equates the mitzvah of the shiva amamin to amalek. Im mitzvahs amalek shayeches b'chol soni Yisrael b'chol dor v'dor ma shayech l'hashvos b'in amalek l'sheva umos. <laughs> okay, so he says like this, the Ramam is equating Shiva Amamin and Amalek. Okay, actually, I'm going to type this out. Okay, so this is this is now. Um, uh, oops, sorry, hold on a second here. Uh, this is now Rav Rabinovich's Rabinovich's uh, Rabinovich's reasoning. Okay, the Rambam equates the mitzvah of seven nations with Amalek, okay? Both are terminal, both can be complete, um, uh, uh, complete, and, uh, you know, both are subject to a state where, where we can say, mission accomplished, uh, this mitzvah is totally done. So Rabinovich's argument is like this. If the Rav is correct, and the mitzvah of eradicating uh, eradicating Amalek applies to any nation that existentially threatens Israel, then the Rambam's whole comparison falls apart. Okay? The whole way, the only thing that allows the Rambam to use Amalek to prove that Shev mitzvahs can be counted is that Amalek is a terminal mitzvah. But according to the Rav, Amalek is not a terminal mitzvah. It applies whenever an enemy comes up, and in any generation, an enemy can come up to destroy us. So it can't be that the Rambam holds that the mitzvah of Amalek can apply to any generation, because then his whole reasoning would fall apart. Okay, this is a sophisticated argument, but it's uh, I think it's a solid argument because this is showing, you know, <laughs> this is showing like this is like a, a commentary by the Rambam on his own mitzvah. You know, he's saying it's clear here that 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 uh, Amalek is. Uh, is a terminal mitzvah, but according to Rav Moshe, it can't be a terminal mitzvah because any nation, as long as there are non-Jews in the world, then uh, then then uh, the mitzvah of Amali could apply, of wiping out Amali could apply. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so then uh, we're going to finish reading this, and then I'll, I'll answer tomorrow's question. Uh, we'll summarize, then we'll finish, uh, answer tomorrow's question. Ella Kavanasa Brura, rather... Back to Rav Rabinovich. Rather, the Rambam's intent is clear. Rather, the Rambam's intent is clear. He wants to establish as a fundamental principle that a mitzvah, which is only practiced for for um, sorry, that a mitzvah that applies for all generations, it's possible that it is no longer practically applicable anymore. Um, so uh, he's, you know, he's, he's just walking us through this reasoning. Okay. Someone who could still argue, Shema ain mitzvah ke'ela klal. Maybe there are no mitzvahs like this at all. Vagam mitzvah sheva umos ina ladoros. And maybe the mitzvah of the seven nations is not for generations. Or Shema adain efshar lekaima. Or maybe you still can complete the mitzvah of the seven uh, nations. Tzarek lechapes achrein ulegalosin. You need to hunt down the remaining members of the seven nations. Lekach tzarek lehavi dugma shel mitzvah shebe hakreach bezman min zmanim tusag matarasa kaliel v'lo tishar efsharos od lasosa. Therefore, the Rambam needs to bring an example of a mitzvah that. Definitely applies at all times, but that its uh, objective is is completable and uh, and it's not possible to fulfill it anymore. 
Bachar Amalek. That's why he chose Amalek. Because Hashem has a promise that I will wipe out uh, Amalek. And everything is revealed before God, even those who have assimilated and been lost. God knows who they are. God promises us that there will be a time when he'll wipe out Amalek's memory. There will be no longer any time in the future when we can apply this mitzvah for, for uh, in practice. But it still is considered a mitzvah for all generations. In other words, just because a mitzvah is no longer applicable doesn't mean that we can't count it for Taryag. Okay, now I see why I use the double lashon. Okay. Um, that was just repeating what, what I talked to you through ahead of time. All of this only applies if we analyze, if we uh, uh, make a judgment based on his statement, God's statement, I will erase uh, Amalek. If this mitzvah of wiping out Amalek is still in force, He's just talking out the reasoning. What comparison is there between Amalek and the seven nations? Uh, how can you learn one from the other? Okay, I, I already read that. Or I already explained it. Okay, hold on a second here. I'm just going to... Um, uh, Okay, I'll uh, just read this um, part. Uh, there's no difference between um, Amalek and the seven nations. All of them have already been lost and been and, and, and assimilated among the nations. Avram ben Aram Avram ben Aram, the Ram's son, writes explicitly, Amalek. Amalek was wiped out in the days of Shaul. Venisha Rak Geza Agagi, the only remnant of Amalek that remained after Shaul was the Agagite, okay, who Haman uh, came from. Va'afhu Kvar Ininu Od, and he no longer exists. Ulam Klabish Mayagalia, Imadai Nisha Shore Pore Rosh Falana, Va'alav Nemar Kim Hamalish and Bamalik Midor Dor, Mehira Yi Hashem Shalem, Vakisi Shalem. So, in other words, there might still be some Amalekites, but uh, you know, eventually they'll be wiped out. Okay, so now he goes back and answers the Rav's question. Now appreciate how exact is the Ramam's golden language in Hilchus Malachim Mohamas. Shemone Shalosh Mitzvah Zoakarzo. The Ramam counts three mitzvahs one after the other. Tchila Kasab Mitzvah Asay Lahakrim Shiva Amamin. So first he says the mitzvah of the seven nations, Ukvar Avad Zikram, and their, their memory has been lost. The Teich of Himshech, and then he continues. Similarly, there's a mitzvah to wipe out the memory of Amalek. And then he says, and it's a mitzvah to remember constantly the actions of Amalek. My vechen, what does the Rama mean by vechen, by similarly? Aren't there two mitzvahs? Why doesn't the Ramam write Vachin by the third mitzvah? So let's just look at this inside again. So the Ramam writes um, uh, over here. Um, mitzvah to say to destroy the seven nations. Then Vachin mitzvah to say to destroy the Malik. And then not Vachin mitzvah to say to remember their, uh, their evil actions. He just says, and there's a mitzvah to say. Okay, so why does he do that? So he says, um, so what he wants to say is that the Vachain is saying that the two mitzvahs of annihilating the seven nations and annihilating Amalek, the Vachain is showing that there's a similarity, namely that they are mitzvahs that are in effect for all generations, but they're no longer applicable nowadays. Okay. Whereas, whereas um, the mitzvah of remembering Amalek is in effect and is applicable nowadays. Zehu Ademion Ha'ikroni. Um, being mitzvah shiva amin and mitzvah zamalik. That's the similarity between the shiva amin and mitzvah zamalik. Lufikach kasa v'chein. That's why he writes v'chein. Of a mitzvah zahor, he shona. But the mitzvah of zahor is different. V'chein daika lo, uh, daik lo lichtov ba v'chein. 
Uh, and um, and that's why he didn't write the chayim. Okay, so in other words, what he's saying is effectively what he's saying is is that the seven nations have already been wiped out and assimilated, and Amalek has also been wiped out and assimilated. Okay, like the Ram says in uh, by the, by Sancheriv, and he's saying v'chein because he's saying that the two mitzvahs are exactly the same. Both of these mitzvahs are in effect, even though they're no longer applicable because they've been assimilated into the nations, just like the Radvaz says. So, in other words. The fact that the Ram doesn't repeat himself for Ukvar Avdu Baba Zikram, he doesn't need to repeat himself because he he was much more economical in his lashon by just saying Vachain, that this mitzvah is the same as the Shiva Amim. So that's how he's answering the the uh, the Ram uh, Rav Moshe's um uh, diok, his uh, his inference. Okay, now I'm going to step in and answer Tamar's question now, even though, and then I want to read uh, the uh, Rabinovich. Okay, and I want to just summarize this. Okay. So, um, so arguments against saying uh, that the Rambam holds by a non-ethnic concept of Amalek. Okay. Um, so argument. Uh, oh, uh, this is, I didn't mean to do this in the middle of this thing here. Hold on. Okay, and again, if you have to go, then then uh, uh, no worries. Okay, I'm, I'm going. I'm going to go over time here. Okay, so argument number one is is uh, first of all the Rambam. <laughs> I think the strongest argument the Rambam never says this in anywhere. <laughs> okay, in other words, if the Rambam held that any enemy that goes to war with Israel or that uh, that 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 wants to annihilate Israel is um, you know uh, takes on the status of Mali, he should have said it. Okay. Um, if he meant it, he should he should have said it. Okay. Secondly, is in every formulation of the mitzvah of Amalek, the Rambam uses the word zera, okay, which means offspring. Okay. I'll just say offspring. Okay. Um, third is in the More uh, 350, um, the Rambam states that the whole reason why the Torah lists the genealogy of Esav, uh, Esav, Esav, is so that we don't kill any other tribe of Esav's descendants except for the specific group of Amalek. Okay? Um, uh um so it's it's clear that Amalek is a specific uh ethnicity. Okay. Likewise, in 341, the Rambam writes that only Amalek was divinely decree uh, uh, had a uh had a divine uh penalty decreed upon them. Okay. Uh likewise, um if, if uh, a Malik can apply to any uh, nation that targets Israel, then a Malik isn't a terminal mitzvah. And the Rambam's entire argument in uh, Sefer HaMitzvos uh, Kuf Pei Zion falls apart. Okay. Likewise, um, the Rambam didn't need to mention about Amalek. Um, they have already assimilated and been forgotten, forgotten because he acknowledged that with uh, Vechain. Okay, but then there's one more argument, which, um, which I think is a very strong argument. Okay, you notice that when the Rav was formulating um, uh, his father's explanation, he said that the ethnic um, imperative to destroy, or the imperative to destroy the ethnic Amalek is from Devarim 2519. Okay. This obligation to, uh, he says, um, my father, Master Ed, we've been charged with two commandments concerning the Amalek. The first is the obligation to blot out his memory. This obligation devolves upon every person with reference to an individual Amalekite and is set forth in the verse, Timche um, Ezecher uh, Amalek. Okay. Um, and that is uh, the one, uh, oh, I'll just read it again. Um, 
Uh, the second is the readiness to do battle as a community against the people of Amalek. This requirement is set forth in the verse, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Thus, if any people seeks to destroy us, we are commanded to do battle against it when it rises up against us. And this battle of ours is an obligatory war on the basis of the verse from Exodus. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. However, the obligation to wipe out individual Amalekites, as set forth in the verse from Deuteronomy, applies only to genealogical descendants of, of Amalek. Okay, so this is a strong argument now, which is like this. Okay, the Rav, uh, or as a Rav Moshe, says that the mitzvah to go to war with Amalek uh, is learned out from uh, the Pasuk in Devarim, whereas, sorry, uh, the Pasuk in, um, in uh, sorry, I, I said that wrong. The mitzvah to exterminate the ethnic individual Amalekites is learned out from Devarim, but the mitzvah to go to war with 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 uh, quote unquote Amalekite uh, nations that target Israel is learned out out from Bishalach. Okay, can anyone think of a of a disproof uh, of that <laughs> based on everything that we've learned? The problem is the Rambam never learns any halakhic obligation from Bishalach. Okay? The Rambam only brings down the Pasuk in Devarim. Okay? And in fact, what does the Rambam learn out from the Pasuk in Bishalach? He learns out that it is Hashem promising that Amalek will one day be destroyed. It may, be, it may come to pass speedily in our days in accordance with his promise, for I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek. OK, so so Rav Moshe, Rav Moshe is totally entitled to come up with his own derivation from the Pasuk and say that we learn from Shemos that there is a separate mitzvah of going to war with a nation that targets Israel. But you can't say that the Ramam learns the Pasuk that way because the Ramam never brings down that Pasuk ever for a halakhic obligation. OK, so these are seven arguments against uh, Rav Moshe's reading of the Rambam. OK, tomorrow, I think that answers your question. I don't know if you're in a position where you can talk. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sure. All right, so now let's finish reading R R Rabinovich and then quickly discuss the implications for today, and then uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, so now he comments on the Rav. He says like this, Ulam mashuva b'shem ha Rav Moshe salvechik zatzal, barur she'enze el adrush. So he says, what Rav Moshe said, it must be there is a drush. It must be it's a non-halakhic statement. Vu amar esad devarim keneged hanatsim yimach shemam. Mo, Rav Moshe said this again about the Nazis. May their name be uh, um, uh, erased. Shem asu maise amalek v'garu amimina baharbe. They acted like amalek, and they were much worse. V'ein safik she mechuva senu lo lishkoach es sheololu lano bnei avla. Without a doubt, we are obligated to not forget uh, the injustice that they did against us. V'lo nislak leposhim b'shum ofen v'naanishim im efshar. We must not forgive their their offenses, and we must punish them whenever possible. Kamosh nasid la'uso rasha eichmen shachik tamia. I don't know what shachik tamia means, but um um, but uh, we that's what like we did with Adolf Eichmann. V'chein yovdu ko oivech Hashem. May Hashem defeat all of our enemies. Ukvar horonu chazal sheish makom ledarshan lomar dvarim sheina meduyakim api hahalacha. So Chazal give permission to a darshan to say things that are not halakhically exact in giving a darshan. I forgot to look this up. So apparently, you know, one might say, how can Rav Moshe make this statement as if it's halakha, if he meant it as a drush? We see that that's a style of drush. Okay, it's a style of drush to give drushas based on halakhic sources, even though you don't mean it halakhically. Okay. Um, Hine makom iti lahas kir mash amrli yedidi harav har gaon rav gaon rav yitzchak shelat shlita sheshama mepi harav harav svi huda hakohen cook so that's all so so rav rabinovich says I heard from my colleague rav shelat uh, who heard from the mouth of rav yitzchak um, uh, 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 svi yehuda cook. Shadato lo haisa nocha mi mashakasav ha grid solvesha shlita, b'shem avi Rav Moshe Zazal. That Rav Cook did not like what what the Rav wrote about this. Binyan said, "V'amar," and he said, "She'enu elo drush." He said, "This is only a drush." V'yesh lihimanei mi lomar dvarim kela, and we should refrain from saying things like this. Okay, why? 
So he goes on, Rabbi Minish goes on and says, So he says, things like this have been said in past generations, okay, where people make these comparisons to Amalek, okay, so in the past, when Rabbanim have said these things, then they've said it in order to motivate or to inspire the people who are afflicted and persecuted uh, in our nation to rely on God's promise that he's going to eventually destroy uh, all of our enemies around us and cut off uh, the, the Amalek. So in other words, they were said to inspire the Jews and say, God's going to take care of our enemies. But those generations were not like our generation. They knew how to differentiate between words of halacha that are taken literally, um, and to differentiate between words of halacha that are taken literally and words of drush and uh, and thought that are said allegorically and metaphorically. We should not blur these lines. Okay. Um, Sof Tavar, mitzvah to say he lives kor tamin mash asa alano amalik. Uh, there is a mitzvah to say to remember what Amalek did to us. We are obligated to do, to do that nowadays. So he says, without a doubt, someone who is motivated to find out exactly who was Amalek and to define the parameters exactly about what the mitzvah is, that person fulfills this mitzvah of remembering a Malik uh, even more. Okay. So what he's saying is he's saying that you should not give these drushos now if people are not going to differentiate between um, uh, halacha and drush. Okay. And again, I want to say also that, um, that, that, uh, that the Rav Moshe did not mean this by way of, uh, of halacha, even though he uses the word halachically. Okay. Because I just don't think that Rav Moshe, I, I think Rav Moshe knows how to learn the Rambam. And like, you can't learn the Rambam in any other way, okay? Now, I did what, uh, in that footnote of the Rav, okay, which ended where I ended reading it, um, Lawrence Kaplan, the translator, says, Rabbi Soloveitchik elaborated upon and partially qualified his above expressed view that any nation that conspires to destroy Knesset Israel becomes, according to the Halach Amalek, in an interview with his student Rabbi Stanley Boylan, cited in the latter uh, by the latter in his essay, A Halachic Perspective on the Holocaust by um, by Rosenberg, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I was interested in this. I was like, oh, the Rav qualified his view. So I, I, someone photocopied for me this, this, uh, this footnote. Okay. So the footnote says, in a subsequent interview, Rabbi Soloveitchik elaborated on his view that a nation could be transformed into a Malik in a metaphysical or halakhic sense. This status of a Malik would not, according to the Rav, create halakhic obligations concerning innocent offspring and spouses, because Maimonides clearly limits action against a Malik to unrepentant elements who have refused to make peace with Israel. However, the animals and possessions of such a nation may very well be included in the injunction, for it also applies to animals of Amalek, according to Rashi. Such an injunction uh, appears to be the reason for the refusal on the part of Mordechai and the Jewish combatants against Haman to partake of the spoils of battle. So the Rav does qualify his view, but not qualifying it to agree with Rav Rabinovich. Still sounds like the Rav is taking this uh, um, halakhically. So then I actually emailed Rabbi Stanley Boylan, who is uh, a professor at Turo, Okay, and uh, and I asked him for an elaboration on the Rav's uh, Shita. So this is what he emailed me. He says, I'm just going to read, we're not going to analyze this, but I'll tell you why I'm reading this here. So he emailed me this on the 25th of October. The Ramam and the Mora had, has no doubt in my mind that on a Malik that is based solely on genetic descent from the original tribe. Okay, so he agrees with me about the, the Mora. What is being asserted by the Rav in the name of his father is that there are two Parshiot and two Chiyuvim. Timcha Ezechar Malik from Devarim may indeed be limited to direct descendants. The Milchama Larshem Ba'amalik Midor Dor can apply to the nation that becomes a Malik. The Milchama might indeed only be relevant to Shas Milchama, to a time of war, and might not apply to every descendant of that group. That might be restricted to the children of a Malik, as seems to be indicated in the Moreh. In the personal discussion, which I referenced with the Rav, he's saying, the Rav did not assert that the children of Nazis would not be included in the Tzivoy, but in asserted that the Ramam's requirement of Bakasha Shalom, even for Amalek, precluded killing the Nazi descendants in our age. So in other words, he's saying that when he talked about this with the Rav, the Rav seemed to hold that, that the Nazis are Amalek halakhically, 
and that the only reason why we don't kill children of Nazis, just like we kill children of a Malik, is because we do have to seek out peace with the Malik, and the children of the Nazis are not trying to go to war with us. But Rav Boylan is saying that the Rav still seem to indicate that the Nazis have the halakhic status of a Malik. Going on in the email, the Rav played with the idea that the Ramam's inclusion of Hatsar Haba Alehim as a Milchames mitzvah was based on his father's understanding of a nation becoming a Malik. Um, so that was in the Koldo Dido fake that we saw that the Ram in the first source, we saw that the Ram says that there are two types of mitzvah wars, sorry, three types of mitzvah wars. There's a war with the seven nations, a war with the Malik and a war of defense to save Israel from their enemies. So the Rav toyed with the idea of saying that maybe going to war with, uh, with the Nazis uh, or with, uh, you know, these Amalekites fits into this third category, even though the Ram seems to be saying that it's a distinct category. Okay, so Reboiling goes on and he says, um, the Rav played with the idea that the Ram's inclusion of a Tzar Haba Alehem as a Milchamas mitzvah was based on his father's understanding of a nation becoming a Malik. I do not feel we need to resort to that to make a defensive war in Milchamas mitzvah. Now, I agree with this, okay? Actually, let me finish reading this and I will, um, uh, I'll go through. I recall that Rav Sternbruch maintaining that while the mitzvah applied to direct descendants, after Sancheriv, we can detect through their actions. In that case, Hamas is not Yishmael, but Amalek through their actions. Okay, so he's saying some want to say that that Sancheriv will help us to um, ha- apply this principle of uh, probability and majority, but you can still identify who Amalek is by how they act. That might work about with Hamas because Hamas at least are like you know Arabs, but like it's not gonna, you're not going to say that the Aryan race uh, of the Nazis are descendants of Amalek. I think that's a really far shita. Okay, then he says like this. I just to add a different perspective. I have heard an interpretation that Milhama Ladashem Ba Amalek implies that a Navi Hashem must identify who Amalek uh, who is Amalek, as did Shmuel Hanavi. I have seen that that in the name of the Briskarov. Uh, I believe on Tanakh, and have heard it also in the name of Aaron Soloveitchik, though not directly from him. Okay, and I have a question in, as you know, we teach uh, Yosef Soloveitchik, who is the great-grandson of Aaron Soloveitchik, so I have a question into him about what his uh, great-grandfather held about this, uh, but I didn't get a response from sheer time. Please understand that mitzvah to wipe out a people would not be lightly undertaken, and the implementation of such a directive might indeed require divine guidance, which is the position of the Briska Rav. Okay, so that was just alternate things. The reason why I'm bringing this in is to show you that that, you know, like, you know, we've experienced this with our Rosh Yeshiva, with Rabbi Chait, that just because someone quotes and says, oh, Rebbe says X, Y, Z, does not mean that that is necessarily his sheet of the way you heard it, okay? The Rav was a thinker. He said different things at different times. He spoke about things on the record, off the record, you know, in a, in a private car, you know, is not necessarily the same thing as a public drusha, which is not the same thing as a halakha safer. You know, there's different contexts. And, uh, you know, and so you have to take this with a grain of salt and uh, and you have to think on your own. <clears throat> but I want to conclude with just a quick comment on um, why this is a dis- uh, an important distinction. I said that the final uh, goal of this year is to explain why the distinction between comparing a modern day enemy to a Malik and identifying with them, a Malik, uh, them with a Malik is important. OK, so let me reiterate. Hamas is evil. Hamas did actions that are like a Malik. Hamas, according to the Ram, is not a Malik. Okay. And the reason why this is important is um, for several reasons. First of all, we need to understand the Torah of Hashem. Okay. And if this is what Hashem is commanding, we need to have, have a correct understanding of Torah. Okay. Secondly, if you're going to maintain that a nation who targets the Jewish people is halakhically a Malik, I just think that such a claim is historically ignorant. Okay. We've had lots of people who have targeted us, okay? The Babylonians targeted us, okay? We never called them Amalek. The Greeks targeted us. We never called them Amalek. We, the Romans targeted us. We never called them Amalek. The Christians targeted us. We never called them Amalek, okay? The, the, you know, the, the, the Muslims targeted us. We never called them Amalek, okay? Suddenly, suddenly, you know, in, in the last 100, 110, 150 years, People will target us and we start calling them a Malik, and then we warp our thinking into saying that the mitzvah of wiping out a Malik applies to any any uh enemy that targets us. That's just not that's just not. I mean, it's, it's you can say it as a drasha, but that's just halakhically, you know, we have lots of enemies. Okay, there are nuances in evil. Okay, the enemy of 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 Rome and Christianity is different than the enemy of uh of 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 uh you know of the Muslims and uh you know. And and, and uh, the 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 Greeks, you know, when when uh, the Maccabees went to war, we wouldn't say that we were fighting a Malik, you know. 
and so I just think that there's a certain like historical ignorance of of the actual history and also how Judaism has processed history, you know, of like, we don't just call everyone who wants to destroy us a Malik, you know, in the Haggadah, when we say, we don't say that in every generation, a Malik wants to destroy us, you know, not every bad guy is a Malik, okay, you can have bad guys who want to destroy us who are not a Malik, and you could say that without diminishing their evil, I still think Hamas is evil, um, and like Rav uh, Boylan pointed out, we already have a category and I'm not, obviously I'm not poskening here, but the war against uh, Hamas is a defensive war against an enemy that is uh, uh, attacking us. That is in the Ramam's Lushan, in the Hamas Mitzvah. Again, I'm not saying whether the present IDF is engaging in the Hamas Mitzvah or not. I, I don't know how to apply this modernly, but I'm saying that like, if you're, if you're coming from the stance of feeling that, that, to not call Hamas as a Malik is somehow minimizing their evil, that's ignorant. If you're saying that minimizing that 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 uh you know that you want to call Hamas a Malik because you want to make it a Milchamas mitzvah, you already have a category of Milchamas mitzvah. You don't need to call Hamas a Malik in order to make your argument that Hamas is evil and that it's a Milchamas mitzvah. Okay, so that's another thing. And the third thing is that I think that this rhetoric can be taken too far, okay? And I don't have, I did not have time to compile evidence against this, uh, or evidence to support this point. But you do see people calling Hamas a Malik and then calling Palestinians a Malik, you know? And I'm going to, um, uh, I read a, a paper by, where did I put it? This is a paper called The Return of a Malik, The Politics of Apocalypse and Contemporary Orthodox Jewry by Martin Jaffe. And he starts off by saying, uh, one crisp February morning in 1994, a kind, public-spirited Jewish physician named Baruch Goldstein emptied the magazine of his Galil assault rifle into the bodies of some 150 Palestinian Arabs while they were at prayer in the mosque at Hebron's, uh, Hebr uh, Hebron's temple, Tomb of the Patriarchs. 29 were killed in addition to the assailant. Quite a morning's work. Okay, now I, I knew about this, about this, this act of terror that this Jew, Baruch Goldstein, uh, perpetuated on Arabs. What I did not know... He says, but this was not just any fine morning. It was the morning of Purim. Okay. And I also did not know that on Baruch Goldstein's grave, and I don't know who wrote this grave, uh, his tombstone says, here lies the saint, Dr. Baruch Koppel Goldstein, blessed be the memory of the righteous and holy man, may the Lord avenge his blood, who devoted his soul to the Jews, Jewish religion, and Jewish land. His hands are innocent and his heart is pure. He was killed as a martyr of God on the 14th of Adar, Purim in the year 57, 54, 1994. So Martin Jaffe makes the argument that we can't know what, you know, what Bar Goldstein's motives were, but it stands to reason that this rhetoric of calling enemies of the Jews a Malik might have motivated him to go and kill Palestinian Arabs, thinking that he's doing the mitzvah of Machias Amalek. You know, now I'm not saying that we're in any danger of that today. But I can see things going further that if this rhetoric keeps up and if this war escalates, you know, God forbid, and people start calling Hamas a Malik and they start calling, you know, Palestinians a Malik, and this is being said in a way that, like Rabinovich warned, that blurs the lines between rhetoric and halacha or drush and halacha, you could see someone perpetuating an atrocity thinking that they're doing the mitzvah of Machias a Malik. And that's why I think that it is a horrendous idea to, to, to keep on uh, promulgating this idea that Amalek is not ethnic, is a non-ethnic group, you know? Last point, okay, and this is where I will meet Rabbi Zimmer partway, okay? Rabbi Zimmer last Tuesday, not this past Tuesday, but the Tuesday before, gave a shear about how we respond to the Tainus, or sorry, how we respond to the Ace Sara, and I think it was a great shear, okay, and I think everyone should listen to it, and his his point was that we need to work on both sides of the coin. We need to work on Shalom and Achdus, uh, among Jews, but we also need to work on hating Amalek. And he, unless he's changed his opinion, now Rabbi Zimmer is someone who also blurs the lines between Drush and Halakha, but he called Hamas Amalek, okay? Um, and um, and he said, we need to hate Amalek, okay? So here's where I'm going to be willing to meet him part way. okay? When the Rama mentioned that we have a mitzvah of arousing our hatred, okay, which I'm just going to read again, in Melachim um, Muhammad 5.5, he says, um, uh, 
mitzvah to say Lizkor Tamin Masav Harayim Ba'arivaso Baderach. We have a mitzvah to say to remember constantly the evil actions and the ambush of Amalek uh, on the way. Kedela Orir Evaso to arouse hatred. Okay. So Shnemar uh, Zachor Esher Asal Lecha Amalek. So we have a mitzvah to arouse hatred against Amalek. Okay. And there are Rishonim who say. I, I, again, I'm not going to quote outside of the Ramam, but there are Rishonim who say that the purpose of this mitzvah is to arouse us to go to war with Amalek. Okay. I'm willing to say that you should remember Amalek and hate Amalek so that you should hate Hamas because Hamas is like Amalek, but Hamas is not Amalek. Okay. So in other words, by identifying, by comparing Hamas to Amalek, okay, not identifying, but comparing them to Amalek, then you will tap into this reservoir of vigilance that the Jewish people have of like having, you know, a, uh, a, a hatred of the enemy that wants to destroy us, an enemy that's like threatening the nation of Hashem, and all that stuff that Rabbi Zimmer was talking about, about hating Hamas, you will accomplish that through the mitzvah of Zechir Amalek, but just don't take that step of identifying any group other than ethnic Amalek with halakhic Amalek. Okay, that's my takeaway message here. Any questions? And uh, I, I won't apologize that this year was so long, but um, but the uh, I wanted to be very thorough here because you know I don't usually give hal- uh, shir, uh, shir on halacha, okay? And uh, and not that you have not that you should be uh, you know more or less like strict in your standards with halacha non halacha, but like I want to make it very clear. I want to dethrone the idea that the Rambam halakhically holds that Amalek is an ideology, okay? Um, I, I it is an untenable position, and I think that anyone who holds that the Ramam holds that the halakha just either is not speaking the halakhically or they just don't know, they haven't learned the sources in the Ramam or don't know how to learn the Ramam. So that's, I, I, I want to uh, uh, go on a, uh, for, to use an inappropriate pun, a crusade against the idea uh, that Amalek is, uh, is halakhically, the halakhic Amalek is an ideology. And I hope I accomplish that. Okay. Thanks for sticking around. <clears throat> okay. If you have any Thank you. thoughts, let me know. Okay. Have a great Shabbos. Thank you. Have a good job. All right. Bye.